Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated, it truly, truly is. Before we get started, let me give you my usual disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Next, if you have not liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so. It really helps me out and I really, really appreciate it. Okay, so today we are talking about Wenda Denise Wright. Wenda Wright and her common-law husband were living together in Titusville, Florida and raising their two small boys together. The couple lived in a tight-knit community where everybody knew everybody. One of their neighbors and lifelong friends was 52-year-old Margaret Allen. In 2005, Margaret was living in an apartment with her roommate James Martin and her two children. Margaret would end up hiring her lifelong friend, Wenda, to be her housekeeper. February 8th, 2005, 19-year-old Quinton Allen stopped by Margaret's home to give her $200 back that he had borrowed from her. Quinton is Margaret's nephew. Some sources say that that's the nephew. Some sources say it's not, but court documents says it is, so we're going to go with court documents. Quinton says that when he stopped that day, James Martin and a man by the name of Keith Bailey, along with Margaret and her two children, were all in the home. According to Quinton, shortly after arriving at the home, Margaret noticed that her purse was missing. She became extremely upset over this since the purse contained $2,000 in cash that Margaret needed for her daughter's disability. She asked Quentin to stay at the home to watch her daughter while she ran out really quick, so Quentin obliged. Wright's partner says that Margaret went over to the home, whispered something in Wenda's ear, and the two left the home together and returned to Margaret's home about five minutes later. Once there, Margaret confronts Wenda with the fact that her purse and her cash is missing. She told Wenda that she knew that it was her that stole it, that she was the only one in the home at the time, and she demanded that she return her purse and her money now. The two women were in the home alone for about 15 minutes before Margaret left the home again and instructed Quentin not to let Wenda leave. Margaret went back over to Wenda's home, told her husband that her purse and money was missing and that she believed Wenda was the person that stole it. She then asked Johnny if he would give her permission to search their home, to which she said fine. When Johnny asked where Wenda was, Margaret told him that she was still back at her house. Margaret searched and she did not find the purse inside of Wenda's home. And Johnny would later testify in court that Margaret had scratches all up and down her arms when he she came over to the house to search. Meanwhile, back at Margaret's house, Wenda was begging Quentin to please let her go back home. Quentin responded to her that he couldn't let her leave, so Wenda sat back down. Margaret returned to the house. Wenda began begging her to allow her to go home. Quentin informed her about the missing purse, to which Wenda replied that she didn't have the purse, she didn't take the purse, and that she would never steal from Margaret. Margaret informed Quentin that Wenda was at the home that morning cleaning fish and straightening up. The two began searching for the purse again for approximately 30 minutes while Wenda sat on the couch proclaiming her innocence. She continued to ask Wenda where the purse was and Wenda would continue to reply over and over again. I don't have your purse. Why would I have your purse as good as you was to me today? To which Margaret replies, well, my nephew is going to plait my hair. And when he is done plaiting my hair, you better tell me where my motherfucking purse is at. Wenda proclaimed her innocence once again, saying, I don't have your purse. Why don't you let me go home? I don't have your purse. Immediately after Margaret's hair was finished, Wenda dropped to her knees, wrapped her hands around Margaret's waist and started to cry, begging and pleading to let her go home, saying, Margaret, please let me go home. All I want to do is go home to see my kids. I don't have your purse. Why are you doing me like this? And if you're going to beat my ass, beat my ass. Just do what you're going to do and let me go home to my kids. 
At one point, Wenda stood up and walked towards the front door. That's when Margaret hit her in the back of the head, forcing her to fall to the floor. Wenda curled up in a ball in the corner of the room, and Margaret began to beat on her repeatedly. When she was done with the beating, Margaret pulled a gun out on Quinton and demanded that he hold Wenda down. Fearful for his life, allegedly, Quinton complies. Margaret goes into the bathroom, then comes back with bleach, hairspray, nail polish remover, and rubbing alcohol. She then proceeded to pour the chemicals on Wendy's face, attempting to get them in her eyes and mouth. Wendy began moving her body back and forth, trying to cover her eyes and her mouth with her hands. During this time, Margaret's young daughter walks into the room. Wendy grabbed three more belts and beat Wendy with them. She then instructed Quentin to tie her legs up with the belt, all while her daughter was still in the room. She then instructed her daughter to go get a piece of duct tape to place over Wenda's mouth. But because of all the chemicals that were poured onto Wenda, the duct tape wouldn't stick. A pissed off Margaret grabbed a belt, put it around Wenda's neck, and pulled. Wenda began to scream. Please stop. Please stop. I'm about to piss myself. I'm about to piss myself. Wenda's body then began to shake and approximately three minutes later, she stopped moving. Margaret's daughter then asked if Wenda was dead, to which her mother replies, Nah, she's not dead. She's just unconscious. That bitch will wake up in a minute. Margaret instructed Quinton to continue holding Wenda's legs just in case she woke up. She wouldn't be able to get away. About two minutes later, Margaret went to grab a pair of sheets to tie up Wenda just in case she regained consciousness. After they were done, Quinton told Margaret that he needed to go buy a cigar and promised her that he would be right back. But Quinton never came back. The following morning, Margaret went out looking for him and she would end up finding him sitting in his car with his brother in front of a barber shop. She walked up to the car, pulled out her gun, and asked Quentin where he had been. Quentin got out. He walked over to Margaret's car. He got inside, and he saw James Martin sitting in the back seat. Margaret told Quentin that Wenda woke up in the middle of the night, that she didn't tell her fast enough where the purse was, and then now she was dead. When Quinton asked where they were going and what she needed him for, Margaret replied, Bitch, what do you think? You're going to help me get rid of this body before my kids come home from school. The three pull up to Lowe's and James Martin goes inside to buy plywood that they would use as a ramp to roll to get Wenda's body onto the back of the truck. After they bought the plywood, the three got back in the car and they drove around. Their next stop was a mechanic shop where Margaret borrowed a heavy-duty dolly. The three returned back to Margaret's home, Wenda instructing Quinton to get Wenda's body that was already wrapped in carpet and move it to the side of the house. She then told him to put the plywood on the back of the truck and tie it to the dolly. The three drove to Margaret's mother's house and got two shovels. From there, they went to find a spot that would be Wenda's gravesite. Margaret found a dirt road with a locked gate, and they began to dig while Margaret served as the lookout until the burial was complete. Before tossing her friend in, her lifelong friend in, Margaret told them to take her carpet because it was evidence. They rolled her into the hole and they covered it with dirt and debris. After they left the gravesite, they drove to a gas station to throw the carpet in the dumpster, went to pick up Margaret's daughter, and went back to business as usual. But the following morning, racked with guilt, Quinton goes down to the police station and tells police about the events that had taken place. And he directed them to where they could find Wenda's body. Because of his confession, Quinton was arrested and charged with first degree felony murder during the course of a kidnapping and kidnapping with the intent to terrorize or inflict bodily harm. Quinton pled guilty to second degree murder. 
became the state's star witness and was sentenced to 15 years in prison with five years probation. The chief medical examiner testified in court that Wenda's autopsy showed that she had multiple bruising on her face, front and back ear, left torso, all over her left side, trunk, right hand, thigh, left eyebrow, forehead, upper arm, and shoulder. A huge part of Margaret's trial was the trauma that she had endured throughout the majority of her life. Margaret's Aunt Barbara testified that she witnessed her mother physically beating Margaret with her hands and fists on a daily basis. Her mother would beat her with belts, whip her with sticks, and smack her in the face. When she was just 12 years old, her mother beat her so badly that Aunt Barbara had to call the police. Her grandfather would also physically abuse her. He would make the children stand in a row, naked, and go down the row, beating them with oak switches. When Margaret was just a child and her mother went to jail, she was forced to stay with her grandfather. She would later confide in Aunt Barbara that her grandfather was sexually molesting her. Her grandfather was also abusive to her mother, and Margaret would witness these events. When Margaret was in her 20s, she would be beat by her then-boyfriend, Bill Skane. <clears throat> Aunt Barbara recalled a time where she was beat so badly that when she went to visit Margaret in the hospital, she did not even recognize her niece. He also kicked her and punched her in the stomach while she was pregnant with their child. Aunt Barbara testified that Margaret's brother would sexually lust to her. And when the, she was a teenager, she suffered a severe stroke that affected her speech and her memory. Neurological physician Dr. Gable testified that because of the years of ABUSA, Margaret had significant intracranial injuries and was at the lower end of the intellectual capacity. He concluded that Margaret's brain injury quite possibly destroyed her impulse control and the ability to control her moods. Neuropsychiatry and brain imaging specialist, Dr. Wu, testified that he gave Margaret a PET scan and that she was showing at least 10 traumatic brain injuries with damage to the frontal lobe. This is significant because frontal lobe affects impulse control, judgment, and mood regulation. So essentially, he's saying that Margaret could not control these because of the trauma. Margaret Allen took the stand herself and testified. She told the court that she grew up in a violent place and was... ABUSE and beaten almost to death on several occasions, causing her to suffer, suffer, causing her to suffer serious head injuries. During cross examination, Margaret testified that she was sorry that her friend was dead, but that she was not sorry when she took the body to the burial place because she didn't do that. I know this has not been easy, but I want you to know that you are up to this. Among the first words the public has heard from Margaret Allen through her tears is that she's sorry for the murder of Wenda Wright. Allen said she shouldn't be put to death for something she didn't do. A jury has already convicted Allen of strangling her housekeeper and pouring bleach and other chemicals on her after accusing her of stealing. A prosecutor questioned whether she really is sorry. Did you feel sorry when you said, thank God that's over? No, that's not true. I didn't do that. I didn't say that. The prosecutor pointed out Allen's own young daughter was present at the tour. Your daughter talked about what you'd ask her to do, go get some tape so that you could tape up your friend, right, the, the one that you felt so sorry for. I wasn't never no killer, no murderer. I was always a loving, caring person. The victim's common-law husband and relatives watched it all, and when it came time for the husband to speak, he looked Allen straight in the eye. I'm, I'm angry about it, yes, but um, I forgive you. She went on to say that when she wasn't addicted to, but she went on to say that she wasn't addicted to, but that she did sell them. 
that she was previously arrested several times for violent crimes and that her daughter lied when she told police that she was present during the incident and that Margaret asked her to bring her duct tape. Thursday, September 23rd, 2010. It would take two hours for a jury of 12 to unanimously vote for the death penalty for Margaret Allen. Quentin Allen was sentenced to 15 years in prison and James Martin was sentenced to 60 months in prison for helping to bury Wenda's body. All right, guys, if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and I appreciate you so, so, so very much. Please leave me a like and a comment. Please subscribe if you haven't yet and you feel so inclined to. And until next time, stay safe out there.